Well, hello. I am Anatoly Shashkin, and I like DOS games and uh, PC games. I don't like games. Why am I lying? I like all games. All games are wonderful. Um, and um, one of my favorite things to do on my channel or Twitter or whatever called DOS Nostalgia is to discuss the difference between the console world and the world of home computers um, not because one was better than the other um, it's just I love the differences I think differences in audience and technology spawn very different products um, that all sort of eventually complement each other in uh, history and uh, because of some of those technical differences between the home consoles and home computers um, for today uh, we're going to take a look at 3D games from the first decade of IBM PC. So we're going to go through um, about 10 years worth uh, of, of uh, 3D games um, of various quality. Um, just as I've said many times before, um, IBM PCs, even when it comes to home computers, IBM PCs weren't exactly the most impressive when it came to graphics or sound in fact they were probably the least impressive um, those were machines made to crunch numbers uh, they were made for spreadsheets and uh, word documents and what have you but as time went on uh, you know the architecture of it allowed for to crunch the numbers and and print out your documents you would want large amounts of storage or RAM or faster uh, processors and uh, all of that of course contributed to um, IBM PC moving away from this slowly uh, into something that probably facilitated gaming a little bit um, more uh, I'm gonna make a note here that uh, when in this window over here um, titles of the games will be displayed uh, the date there will be for the PC version some of those games were available on multiple platforms so the year that you'll see there is specifically for the uh, PC version and also when I'll be showing off some uh, video footage of some of these games um, a lot of them will probably function at the speed faster than what was available when they just came out I mean it's an open platform um, you know you could have a faster CPU or slower CPU at the same you know in the same year some people who couldn't afford faster hardware would have to settle for something less um, so we'll take that into account and uh, and we'll move on from there so let's dive into the world of 3d games head on one of the first and biggest things on PCs was simulators something about people who bought expensive machines for their home uh, there, there was a big Venn diagram overlap with people who wanted to control big powerful and uh, often dangerous things and they wouldn't mind that uh, doing that from the comfort of their own home um, a big part of it is of course flight simulators planes people just wanted to fly planes and the uh, one of the major franchises of that time I mean it's it's actually just been revived of sorts is Microsoft Flight Simulator um, uh, the first PC version arrived in 1982 a, a year less I think a little bit less than a year technically uh, after the launch of IBM PC on August 12th and of 1981 um, and uh, that's this was this this was the peak of technology you're looking at uh, Chicago a representation of Chicago's MIGS field which I don't think is there anymore um, taken off um, uh, yeah this also is fairly interesting because well this is like Microsoft first big foray into into video games this uh, by that point things were a bit you know uh, IBM PC is taken off but it hasn't taken over in in a sense that it has since then but this was this product was bought by Microsoft uh, for the purpose of you know turning it into a big gaming sort of franchise and it succeeded and now we'll take a look at how sort of things improved graphically throughout uh, the years here's a second version uh, of uh, Microsoft Flight Sim 
um, third and uh, the fourth so that's that for the 80s um, again the genre is extremely popular and uh, there, there are dozens dozens and dozens of flight simulators uh, like f-15 strike eagle this is a 1985 version there's a sequel um, this is a Falcon 3.0, one of the, uh, well, the, the last entry in the Falcon series on, on DOS. Um, I don't have it handy, but I love showing the manual to this, uh, to, to, to people who are not familiar with the genre, because it's like 320 plus pages. You can kill somebody with it, and it's very comp comprehensive, and uh, it's just, it's ultra realistic. I, I'm pretty sure if you're actually good at these games, unlike myself, like reading the Falcon, uh, manual combined with the game probably in the jam you'd be able to at least start up and maybe even take off in an actual plane they they're meant to be super realistic i am terrible at these games i'm i'm i i'm, I'm not that technically oriented so the, the only one i could play is let's see if this will crap out on me is f29 retaliator which was a lot more arcadey um more fun uh it didn't it even had the mode that would put you in the air instantly if you didn't know how to take off and if you never figured out how to land it had that really cool cinematic um eject mode uh which i used very often it was fun to just fire up and play and uh, it, it it runs really fast as you can see and it's uh, it's really really cool for again 1990 uh pretty good um, what I'm going to show off here is the intro for uh, LHX Attack uh, Chopper. I'm not going to show the game itself. It's a helicopter simulator. But this intro just screams, we have 3D. We figured out the 3D. You'll see why. And you can see on the bottom there is the old um, Electronic Arts logo. Um, who remembers when it was that still? Let me know in the chat. Um, another thing before we get to the uh, fun 3D part is uh, I'm not going to talk too much about flight simulators here, but a few years ago I did a podcast uh, uh, with, um, and my guest on that podcast, uh, a guy named Chris Olson, is an actual pilot and he came in and talked for several hours and we covered, I think, like 85% of all DOS flight simulators available. If you look for Dust Nostalgia podcast Flight Sim on the internet, you'll see, uh, you'll hear all about it if you're interested. And here, this is the part which I love it. Just like, ah, oh, logo, logos, the Electronic Arts logo, just flying. Look at it, the look at the 3D stuff. It also does cool things with sound because around the same time, you know, PC started getting some sound, so uh, it was cool for the time. All right, so don't like to fly new planes and new helicopters how about some old planes there was plenty of those as well or for something more unique here's a, a game that simulates flying uh like an old mail delivery plane which is a pretty interesting idea uh, from 1985 also quite technically impressive um don't like flying planes let's get back to the ground and here's a tank simulator there was a bunch of those um, where you could control a tank. Uh, we can even go on water. And here is the uh, the American Challenge, a sailing simulator. It pretty much uh, does what it says on the cover. Um, and, uh, you know, not visually too impressive, but it was very cool uh, for their time. Don't like to stay on the surface of the water. We got submarines as well. Uh, this is a <laughs> this is a das boot, uh, which is fairly unrelated uh, to the movie, but but a really cool, well done um, uh, simulator. So that's you know simulators were a huge genre. You could simulate anything. Of course, uh, what we haven't covered yet is uh, things that didn't actually exist. Here's a UFO from, from the creators of Microsoft uh, Flight Simulator. And here I am about to abduct someone uh, from um, uh, San Francisco, circa 1989. Um, of course, 
uh, we can come down to Earth again. And of course, what else? Cars, racing cars, right? So many 3D racing games. I'm pretty much just going to show off this one for the most part, because this is one of the more technically impressive ones. I mean, for 1989, this is crazy. Uh, it has really cool optimization techniques to to use the limited resources that the machines of the time had to its advantage and also uh, as accurate as uh, they could get at the time and uh, very impressive. And uh, I'm, despite the low resolution, I mean, it still looks uh, really, really good. It even has like real time uh, polygon tessellation, so level of detail. Like if you had a, a slower PC, it would actually uh, make the complexity of the models uh, lesser in real time. It's 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 really really cool. Um, uh, don't like uh, accurate physics simulation while going around in a circle. Sure, here's uh, Death Track from Dynamics, uh, very inspired by the Roger Corman classic uh, Death Race 2000. Here is a futuristic post-apocalyptic racing game where you have to win the race, but uh, that task is easily accomplished if you just uh, take out your opponents uh, using various uh, weapons. A really cool presentation, uh, fun gameplay. Um, uh, really really cool uh, been tried the remake has been attempted a few times and it's never never really reaches the level of the simplicity and engagement as as this version for some reason um, another one I always love to point out and if anybody can think of a better example uh, I'm all ears but I think this is the first of its kind because this is the first open world racing that also happens to be in 3d so there is no opponents to race uh, for each of the tracks you're just given a destination point and it's up to you to reach it's uh, you know to reach your destination um and in this specific game you're given a uh, very three-dimensional although quite flat <laughs> representation of uh, what allegedly is san francisco but it's really really cool and you can see the uh, excellent representation of, of my terrible driving skills here uh, but yeah this uh, for 1989 there was nothing else quite uh, like it um, and uh, it's it's pretty wild um, in fact to this day there is not that many open world uh, driving games uh, a genre I'm, I'm sort of fond of even as a person as a person who doesn't like cars I don't like racing but I'll, I'll take open world driving um, so yeah this is really, really cool. And of course, uh, this is a classic. Some of you might recognize it. It's called Stunts, uh, inspired by uh, hard driving arcade games, which also got uh, their DOS ports. Uh, this is a game where you become one with the vehicle by understanding its physics, and you perform death-defying stunts on tracks that could never exist in 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 real life and i i'm just going to watch a little bit of this uh, replay because it's really really cool and it lets you uh record replays and control multiple cameras here i'm pushing some bat buttons to, to change the views all really really cool if you played this game and you remember it let me know in the chat all right, let's move on. Now let's go back. No, back. Let's go higher than we have before and go into space. Uh, there's a bunch of 3D space simulators, but the most well-known is, of course, uh, Elite, a space trading sim where you, you know, fly around, sell goods, fight pirates, or become a pirate. It's very open-ended in this procedurally generated um, universe and uh, docking is the hardest part until you get a docking computer here i have accomplished it fairly easily <laughs> and i'm so proud of it that i stopped the recording um available on many platforms came from the um uh, from the 8-bit british microcomputers but it's available on DOS as well in several versions this is the earliest um, uh, version of it for pcs uh, mech warrior from dynamics uh, Pretty much every mech game starts 
here. It's in 3D. It's using a, a, a Battletech license, um, and it's in real time. Um, and uh, yeah, basically, you can trace every Mech piloting game back to this. It's it's they sort of nailed it. You know, the movement and how the uh, gameplay functions and how you can do location damage uh, on the opponent's mechs and you know has randomly generated missions and uh, it's it's a very cool game uh, again from 1989 um, quite a few years have passed since then sports um, there are a few 3d sports games from the first decade uh, even more if you count all those like uh, simulations of uh, racing and sailing as existing sports but one I love to show off is 4d boxing um, this is a really cool one because uh, it's a boxing game with the uh, three-dimensional uh, players customizable three-dimensional players and while you can play on a 2d plane there are multiple st uh, static cameras but you also have uh, you know full-on first-person view and it looks a bit janky when you look at the footage but uh, it's actually quite responsive and everything is mostly telegraphed well and it's easy to control you sort of uh, hold the action button in combination with uh, like a grid of buttons and that allows you to do uh, multiple hits you can also play from the first person point of your opponent if you want there's quite a few um, cameras really really uh, uh, cool game interesting implementation Adventure, a bit slower paced, um, more easily accessible genre. And I always have to start with The Colony, the game that uh, arrived, well, the game that originated on the Macintosh, um, you can tell by these graphics, but uh, on DOS it's in color. Um, this is sort of a, this is very much an adventure game. You're through a series of unfortunate events, you end up at this station and you get to navigate it in uh, high resolution 3D and interact with the uh, objects uh, and solve puzzles in a more traditional sort of 2D view once you point and click once you approach it. Um, fairly technically demanding, as you can see, there's like single digit frame rates here. Uh, but really, really cool. and. Um, and yeah, especially for that early on, super impressive. Uh, let's move on to others and probably more well-known ones, at least to some people or in certain parts of the world. Um, this is Driller, also known as Space Station Oblivion uh, in the States. And this is a similar thing. You find yourself in a sort of a surreal world. You wouldn't get to interact with stuff, although your interaction is mostly limited to shooting things, but shooting some things uh, means one thing like you can kill an enemy or you can turn something on by shooting it like a switch uh, and stuff like that um, Full 3d you can look up and down. It's 60 degrees of freedom um, When you get to it and half half of the fun is figuring out what are those? Abstract objects supposed to be it's actually is fun because it's supposed to be alien and you sort of go around shooting things and figuring out how to solve uh, puzzles you can die uh, or there are enemies so um, yeah but it's a really cool technology also available in a lot of 8-bit microcomputers where it runs a lot slower and, and looks much simpler but it's still very very impressive uh, the technology itself is so impressive that uh, uh, they gave it a name this uh, technology the engine has a title it's called freescape and they use the kind of two companies use that technology to create uh, follow-ups to uh, to driller which all came out like uh, a year apart um, uh, uh, sort of so driller was followed up with dark side then we have total eclipse which is like Egyptian themed um, and uh, castle master which was uh, medieval themed uh, but that wasn't over then the technology was so popular that uh, uh, the, the company behind it released a construction kit a 3d construction kit also known as virtual reality studio in the States which allowed the users create 
their own games using um, that same technology and a lot of um, uh, perseverance. But uh, yeah, you could you could uh, do it if you wanted to. It was pretty cool. Here's the uh, um, uh, an adorable shopkeeper from the demo game that uh, comes with it. Um, in fact, this was apparently popular enough when they released the second revision of this uh, editor in the uh, in the year after, in the year 1992, uh, with like a better scripting capability. Um, and you could uh, not only you could make stuff with it and play it in the editor, you could also make your own standalone games. It came with a standalone uh, a player, game player, and you can just distribute your games. And I believe uh, the the license w was not restrictive at all. You you could potentially um, sell it. Um, both versions of the 3D construction kit came with uh, VHS tape um, to make them even more vintage retro. And I believe you can watch the tapes uh, on YouTube. Uh, I believe they're more of the promo kind, which is weird because you already spent the money. Uh, I don't think they actually explain much of how to use the actual product. It's, it's not very intuitive, uh, I gotta say. Uh, platformer. Well, there, there is a reason I put platformer. I, I meant it. it I, I mean one. Uh, as far as I know, this is probably the first uh, instance of, a, of an actual 3D platformer. Uh, you can sort of argue some arcade games probably came before this, but um, this is uh, Alpha Waves, uh, known as Continuum in the States. And this is actually a very simple game. You sort of, your little ship bounces on surfaces that are not the main floor and gains height every single time. And you have a control to rotate the ship left and right uh, and uh, sort of change the angle of the view of the camera and to control the thruster to, to propel your ship forward and it's that's it and it has interconnected hub levels and it's also has like a puzzle element um uh, this is again pretty wild uh fairly uh, fairly uh, this is unheard of for 1990 um i would say not a bad attempt uh of transposing a genre into 3d space and it has all the elements I uh, I sort of like uh, about the game. It's uh, innovative, it's in 3D, it's for DAS, and it's uh, French. So, for me, I, I, I really, really like it. And um, it's not remembered um, enough in the pantheon of uh, 3D platformers. Puzzle games. Um, there are a few. I am going to show off one, which is my favorite, and it's a game called The Sentinel or The Sentry in the United States. And this is like a really weird game where you collect the energy of the items on a playfield, on a 3D playfield, to build your own objects and build other bodies for yourself because you can't move your stationary. You can only rotate, but you can move by teleporting yourself to another body. Um, and then, whoops, uh, technical difficulties, <laughs> pay no attention. Uh, but yeah, and the goal is to overtake uh, these sentry drones, which are like your size and they rotate. And that's where the action element comes in because you don't want them to be looking at you. Um, uh, you want to move quick. Interesting, very interesting concept. Uh, I think it's very executed. There's like a thousand levels or something. And uh, a, this is, it's fun to play if you're into thinking quick and also, you know, being in, in, in sort of constant danger. It's, it's not like one of those relaxing uh, uh, puzzle games at all. Uh, fun fact, this in, in a sense is a, is a cult classic. And it got remade in the mid '90s for uh, PC and PlayStation under the title Sentinel Returns, and it has this really weird, like polygonal sort of 
creepy gross aesthetic and uh, music by uh, the famed horror director john carpenter uh, yep so uh, there you go that's the sentinel action uh, here is the genre that uh, is is sort of a more more accessible to uh, uh, to uh, to the general public than let's say a lot of the previous stuff was. So let's see what we have on the on the pointy and shooty uh, kind of a play field. So this is Triclops Invasion. Um, that's a weird one that not a lot of people know about and uh, I like to show off because it's completely different from most of the stuff that uh, that I'm showing off here uh, this is like you have a 3d world and you have a plane and two tanks that you can see right over there those two squares on the bottom are, are two tanks and you can switch between them and you sort of control them in the 3d space the camera is static but you have a uh, control over when to redraw it and your mission is to kill those uh, walker robots that look like they might be a little bit inspired by um, uh, at hats from um, from Star Wars and you shoot at their legs uh, and uh, if you shoot at the legs enough they will eventually fall over and die um, even I will point out specifically in, in, in this case because I am actually still playing at the faster speed you can see that the frame rate is really low but I'm playing the, at the probably a faster speed that you would be able to play it in, in, in 1986 uh, so it's a fairly complicated game but uh, but a really cool attempt at sort of like third person 3d um, yeah so let's move on to star glider well it's a simple fly shooty thing very smooth from Argonaut software uh, people who went on eventually to create the Super FX chip for Super Nintendo and, uh, uh, you know, were responsible for Star Fox. And I think it's the, the beginnings of that are fairly apparent uh, uh, over here. Take a glass. Let's, let's take... I, I don't know why I'm, like, rushing through this so fast, but I understand I'm, I've only been on for for half hour and... Let's take it in. Let's uh, let's take it in and enjoy the three D from. I mean, I know some people who are some people worked for me who are younger than this. That's pretty crazy. And uh, check out not product placement, but check out my awesome Doom Cup. Well, I'm trying to time stretch. All right, good enough. Let's move on. Um, Virus. This is a game by the programmer, one of the programmers of Elite. And this is a really weird one. I mean, it's cool looking and cool implementation. But you know this game Lander, where you sort of navigate some caves or complicated environments and you can only control the thrusters in a direction and it's really, really hard to control? Well, it's like this with the six degrees of freedom in 3D and with shooting in enemies. Needless to say, not an easy game to play. Uh, it's, it, it is extremely frustrating. But it's also sort of a rewarding in a sense once because once you don't fail a million times and like that one time you actually manage to keep your ship in the air and not hit anything and maybe kill a few enemies and stuff. It's it, it, because the game runs at a fairly high speed. It feels pretty cathartic. And so in a sense, it's, it's a very rewarding experience. Uh, Archipelagos. This is interesting because a lot of people, well, a lot of people, when you look at it online, it's classified as a puzzle game, but this is more like not so much of a puzzle as like react quickly kind of a game. So you're in this, uh, you're in these islands and you have to protect them from, um, from being, uh, destroyed by pollution. So you destroy those objects that cause pollution. And move on to the next island. There's like also like five thousand levels, um, and uh, you have to act quick because uh, the slower you go, the more polluted 
the environment becomes and that makes your movement harder you can only move on those green checker tiles and uh, the plants and other objects spread these red tiles and those prevent you movement you can only move like in a uh, in a clickable like straight lines interesting uh, concept um, another one of those cold classic 80s 3d game that got remade in the 90s and and, and nobody cared David Wolf, Secret Agent, another Dynamics game from 1989. This is one of those multi-genre games where each level is its own minigame. Uh, I'm just showing off one here, but it's not a particularly great game, but it's very 3D. And another thing, it uses digitized 16-color photos to, to, um, d uh, to tell its simple and cheesy story. But... Uh, all the 3D is really, really cool. It's tough to control, it's tough to play. Half the time, it's hard to figure out what to do. But each level is its own unique thing. And I think things like that, like that, uh, are, are pretty cool and, 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 and really fun when it comes to 3D. Excellent, uh, interesting use of 3D, especially because everything is so unique. Star Glider 2. Not much to say. In comparison to the original Star Glider, I just put it here because, well, you can see what kind of a difference does a couple year make. A couple years in technology being developed, as well as a couple years of technology becoming more affordable for homes. So, this is a lot more Star Foxy. I think I haven't played much Star Fox, but it looks Star Foxy to me. Uh, Midwinter. Um, you ride around the snowy landscapes and shoot your enemies. Not much to say, but cool, big, large environments, uh, interesting enemies, interesting setting. Um, and uh, this game has a sequel where it's even a bigger world. You actually have multiple selections of vehicles and planes and, and whatnot. And it even has a strategy element on top of it, like an open world strategy element. Um, a bit too complicated for me, but very cool. Oh, this is one of those games that I wish was better remembered. It's called Interphase. And this is also one of those games where where you are in you are a hacker called Chad and you are inside of a virtual representation of an actual uh, system. Uh, like this is this is meant to be you hacking. And this, I think, is one of the first games that did it. People always bring up System Shock, but that's like a good five years prior. And your partner, uh, she moves through the actual building. Uh, and it's your, and like she encounters like closed doors or some kind of systems. And it's up to you as a hacker inside the system to uh, sort of help her by destroying certain objects or sort of doing uh, uh, other stuff. Like here, I'm going to destroy that cube that controls the door and she'll be able to move on it's uh, really fast it's made by this company called the assembly line who are really good uh, well assembler programmers and uh, they did quite a few 3d games and this one i think is one of the more sort of uh, interesting ones and 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 really cool looking um really really cool stuff um and historically it's 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 pretty interesting as well uh, and i wish it was more recognized it's it it sadly isn't Movie licenses. Well, you wouldn't think of movie licenses as being on the forefront of technology often, but occasionally you'll get an occasional determined programmer or a few, and uh, you're gonna get some interesting stuff like Die Hard by Dynamics. This is like the fifth Dynamics game from 1989 on this list. Very, I'm very impressed. This is, I believe, the, is the first Die Hard license. And as you can see, you have a full 3D representation of uh, Nakatomi Plaza. Um, you're only allowed to turn in 90 degrees, but you're shown your full rotation. The game is sort of uh, unnecessarily complicated with controls. Uh, you can do multiple moves. You can arm yourself. You can roll. When you aim, you're actually given the control of John McClane's arm to move um, it's a bit janky but uh, at the same time um, 
it's 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 really really impressive so yeah here's me shooting a guy and you can like shoot their corpses and stuff and the beats from the movie are actually represented in it and uh, it's it's a really cool example of an early sort of creative license use with a, a lot of technology mixed in uh beverly hills cop this is another one of those multi-genre games where where each level is its own sort of mini game and level four is this 3d maze thing which is you know clearly a proto first person shooter all the elements are here the walls there's doors there's enemies you shoot them there are exits entrances and stuff um i however don't remember a scene in the movie where axel foley goes around a glass maze shooting flying robot fish but that could be wrong i mean it's been a while since i've seen it so there is that definitely an interesting example of an early sort of uh pre uh, proto first person shooter of uh, before the genre got officially recognized that's, that's something more concrete the terminator Oof, by Bethesda. Uh, I wish I captured more footage for it, but uh, this is a very Bethesda-like game. It's super ambitious. Uh, the the premise is that you either play as Kyle Reese or the Terminator, and you're given this open-world map of Los Angeles where you can traverse it freely, um, and your goal is to either kill or protect Sarah Connor, you can even enter and drive vehicles. There's almost the entire keyboard is your control. Like I managed to start a car, start a start a car here, but I, I I couldn't drive it. I don't know what happened. And it's manual. There's manual and automatic transmission. This was an automatic transmission car, um, and uh, it, and you know it, it's absolutely crazy for for the time. Like to have the open world. Uh, LA and you can like go into shops and you can steal stuff from them you can go into like useless buildings uh, I think as Kyle Reese you can uh, you can go in the store and, and steal some condoms uh, which will result in the eventual game over even uh, even if you kill the Terminator I think that actually happens um, the, the game was certainly obtuse back when it came out and these days it's 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 near impossible to play i think but it's fun to check out and uh, yeah bethesda had their eye on big things big ambitious things uh early on quite obviously so let's move on to uh oh yes robocop 3. uh i'm cheating a little bit as you can see this is from 1992 so i'm, I'm moving past the original decade but I, I i like it this is from the company that made uh terminator uh, the flight simulator games and they use that same technology to do those this robocop game uh e again each level is a different 3d mini game but there are some first person shooter levels which i think fit very well with that whole uh, Robocop thing. I mean, uh, I think it's a really good representation of uh, and a setting for a, a serving the public trust, protecting the innocent, and upholding the law. And um, fun fact, just like other Robocop 3 licensed games, this game came out before the movie hit the screens um, because it was uh, the movie set on the shelf for a while. Um, um, because Orion Pictures went out of business. So there is that. But it looks really cool, I, I think. Let me know if you played it. Not a lot of people have played this one or even heard of it. But let me know in the chat if you have played it. And as you can probably tell, uh, all the games that I sh have showed off here have one thing in common. They're all made using flat shaded polygons. And yes, texture mapping was the big thing and a bit too much even for powerful ibm pcs off its day uh, however we have one fairly early example this rpg called alternate reality the city actually uses a technique called ray casting to calculate the image on those walls even on the you know on the side as well as in front of you it doesn't have full 3d motion but that's how it does those um, uh, the, the the walls are calculated in vertical chunks and give you a sort of uh, an illusion of 3d representation 
this is fairly notable because a few years later, uh, id Software would use the same ray casting technique uh, in their 1991 first-person shooter, Catacomb 3D, which was published uh, on a uh, on a disc mag on a on a magazine on a digital magazine on a floppy disk. So, didn't particularly set the world on fire, even though this was pretty revolutionary in a way and very polished in a sense for for a short game but id software of course used the same uh technique in their recognized shareware mega hit wolfenstein 3d um here it is and this was the well 1992 once we move past the original decade uh of ibm pcs it took uh, over a decade uh, to to overcome the no texture uh, issues and uh, eventually this is the beginning of everything that we have today uh, another notable title from 1992 is of course Ultima Underworld which does not use ray casting and I'm playing this here at the speed that much exceeds anything that you'd be getting probably even a couple of years after the game came out but you can see there's a it's a fully textured environment it's very complicated the game itself is very revolutionary right it's not just uh the 3d hack and slash element of it but also you know it's a, it's a proto immersive sim is i guess what we call them now and uh yes so this first decade of 3d games on pc put forth this uh uh this uh, groundwork for what we have now and 25 years later a quarter of a century later from that we have stuff like photorealistic food in final fantasy 15 uh, i believe and uh, that was it for the 3d games uh from the first decade of ibm pc I hope it was fun or educational or maybe some of you got a few titles that you might want to check out on your own. Let me know if there are any 3D games uh, that you liked from that time um, that I haven't included here. And I am Anatoly Shashkin, also known as uh, Das Nostalgic on Twitter and some dark corners of the internet. And I am going to spend the rest of the uh, the remaining 15 minutes to field questions from the chat. Do I have any more panels covering post-1991? You mean as far as the 3D games? I mean, not really, but... I have a few videos online of compilations of games starting from 1991. It was just like, does games that I've enjoyed. If you do a YouTube search... Um, for MS DOS games in 1991 through 1995, um, uh, you can see there's just like YouTube compilations of footage for like a, a minute or so of each. They're fairly long, but I had fun putting them together. Mostly, if you are like not familiar with some titles, you get to see a bit of a gameplay and see if you may be interested in it, and you can check it out on your own. And I have a couple of panels uh, that I did for Long Island Retro on my YouTube channel um, online as well. It's all on my YouTube channel, Das Nostalgia, on, on YouTube. You'll find everything there. This is interesting. I actually, I have not... Um, speaking of girly games, I don't know that, uh, that many, um, sadly. This is something I should look into. Interesting. I don't even... Uh, I've never seen that demo, I don't think. But I'm gonna check it out. Yeah, Jazz Jackrabbit and its 3D bonus game. I, I think recently uh, uh, on Twitter I saw that that, that that engine actually was reused into a different, in a different game. And that the name escapes me at the moment because it was something I wasn't familiar with. But it's interesting to see technology from a, a, a shareware DOS game get reused in a different um, game, at least in a sense, at least from an epic game. 
I don't think there's quite another case of that happening for, for that company specifically. And all those like fake 3D things are, uh, are also pretty exciting. I mean, let's face it, like the Wolfenstein 3D is not what people would call real 3D. It's just a rendering on a single plane. I mean, hell, even Doom technically isn't. Although people who say like, oh, Doom is not a 3D game. I mean, it's 3D enough. Ron, uh, yes, I use uh, uh, DustBox. I most I have vintage PCs, but most of the time, like ninety percent of the time, uh, I am, am using DustBox. All the screenshots that you've seen today and all the videos have been. Um, uh, I've had I, I've used DustBox to take them. So yes. Steven, it's not just the uh, 2D assets that have multiple sides like sprites. Yeah, that's uh, but even in the way that it 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 uses what it uses to calculate the, the argument against <laughs> Wolfenstein 3D and Doom not being real 3D stuff is they don't calculate anything in real 3D. It's, it's essentially a flat map that just has well in case of Wolfenstein doesn't even have height values, but it's essentially an illusion of, of 3D. But honestly, Everything on the 2D screen is is an illusion of, of uh, 3D, and uh, in a sense. Uh, uh, but yeah, games like System Shock or uh, you know Quake actually use three-dimensional map to to to, to figure out uh, all its equations. While Doom really doesn't. But I mean, who cares? Doom is Doom. Doom is great. The most great set. Stellar Seven. Yeah, I I should have probably included it. This then like a third of this showcase would have been, um, uh, would have been a, a Dynamics <laughs> catalog. Dynamics were were very very prolific, uh, um, in 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 really interesting ways. And then they got bought by by Sierra, and we're still fairly prolific, um, um, in many things. Arctic Fox, yes, that's another cool one. Uh, although PC version is not something um, interesting to look at, but definitely, definitely, yes, that's sort of like I didn't show Battle Zone, but a lot of those sort of original, like Stellar Seven, Arctic Fox, and and, and many others, um, do originate from essentially trying to replicate and uh, improve on the concept of uh, Battle Zone, for sure. Uh, yes, Benjamin. A lot of the yes, a lot of the '90s games did apply Goro shading. Um, I almost showed one, which was like that driller um, uh, style game called Cybercon Three, which is essentially those sort of things, but with Goro shading um, on top of that. But I I wanted to limit it to to the first decade. I think it's the most sort of interesting when the technology is so limited. So I uh, I, I definitely. Uh, I mean, there's so many, uh, so many cool 3D games on PC. Um, even after like the sort of Wolfenstein and Doom era, where things got steered more into like commercial first-person shooter direction. I mean, there's there's tons of really really cool 3D games. Or even like in the early 3D accelerator era, there's also some some absolutely crazy stuff. Uh, besides what what we now sort of think of classic early 3d games steven that's version of Mega Man x that's version of Mega Man x is fine i think it's a fine port i, I have like i said but i haven't played the uh, the the actual Mega Man x a lot but what i've played of the dust version plays fine controls fine it's it's funny that it was made by the, it was ported by the same guy who created the the m much maligned uh, DOS Mega Man one and uh, three, you know the, the games that everybody makes fun of. So uh, yeah, that's uh, same guy who's responsible for a very very well done port of Mega Man X. And I think it's quite incredible and cool cool legacy. But I guess Mega Man X on DOS is not as remembered now because you can't make fun of it so uh, as you could of the sort of the, the first two Mega Man PC games I mean for a reason 
Yes, there is. A, there, <laughs> yes, Benjamin. Uh, in fact, I, I didn't really show off that many. Uh, there, there are quite a few more. Like, I can, if if I wanted to, if I really wanted to be like, oh, here's my nearly like comprehensive list of 3D games uh, from the first decade, the list would probably be at least double the size easily, especially when it comes to simulators. Lots and lots and lots of simulators. Said I don't have any music queued up. That's for the next time. Although hopefully next time we'll all see each other in person, right? This is good. This is this is this is fun. Um, but uh, hopefully, right by next year, we'll we'll all be able to sit in a small room next to each other, and uh, and uh, I'll tell you something else about the wonderful world of famous dust games. All right, seeing how it's delayed, uh, I'm, I'm I'm probably going to cut off. So thanks very much to everyone for stopping by. Love you all. Be healthy. Be safe. And keep playing those games.